how racist is our international war machine? Can you talk about that? It's camouflaged. So there's virtually no discussion of systemic racism, even though in the last few years, especially after the police murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, there has been in the mass media more discussion of systemic racism. You know, we on the left 10 or 20 years ago might have used that term, but it went mainstream in the last few years. A lot of discussion of systemic racism, not enough, but that's a real step forward because so many institutions of the United States are systemically, structurally racist. That's how they function. That's the foundation and the MO of how they operate. Important to name that, analyze it, and challenge it. What was stunning to me as I worked on this War Made Invisible book is that virtually every victim of U.S. military firepower in the so-called war on terror has been a person of color. And that is hidden in plain sight. This point that, as you said, uh, appeared on Salon today and Common Dreams yesterday, LA Progressive, other outlets have been posting it, all progressive outlets that are willing to do that. And there are many daily newspapers that have refused to publish a piece by me exactly on that point. It's not as though they can say, oh, we've, we've run this before. It's a virtual pariah point. It's hidden, as I say, right in front of us. It's, and I think of the, the parable story that I think many of us grew up on. I don't know if it's still as popular, uh, called The Emperor's New Clothes where the pretense of the emperor to be wearing this finery is contradicted by reality. He's he's in his underwear, he's parading down the street. But everybody is so acculturated and in some ways frightened that nobody mentions that and people all pretend that it isn't right in front of them. And in many ways, I think the structural racism of U.S. foreign policy and the war on terror is somewhat in that category, where structural racism, as I said, is now an acceptable topic in a lot of realms, a lot of uh, venues. But it's as though it stops at the water's edge, as the saying goes. And that just, again, it's a sort of a intellectual, emotional corruption that is so real and so powerful. Daniel Ellsberg Presente. He's really somebody who's had a massive effect on the last 50 years. I was really pleased that I was able to record an interview with him about a year and a half ago that is in the book. And I think really the most, in many ways, important few pages of the book, because what Dan was saying there is that, yes, it's important to show the suffering the human suffering from U.S. military actions, it's unclear how much difference that would make. Yes, it's important. It's not happening. It should be happening. But we've been acculturated, as he put it, to believe that the United States, or I should say many people have been acculturated to believe that the United States has the right and the duty to be a de facto empire. And if we accept that idea, then it's a very short a journey to deeply believing that we're better than everybody else and that the suffering of other people really doesn't matter if it's necessary, quote unquote, for advancing U.S. geopolitical advantage. Uh, near the end of the book, I take apart the cliche American exceptionalism or that the United States uh, is the indispensable nation. These are bandied about by liberal Democrats as well as Republicans. And really, the United States is only indispensable to itself, but it's the hubris and the might makes right attitude that enables many people to internalize it and accept it. Daniel Ellsberg was willing and able to say that he was wrong. He served the military state during the escalation of the war in Vietnam. And later on, and at the Institute for Public Accuracy and our Exposed Facts program, we actually put up 
uh, many billboards at some prominent uh, bus stops in Washington, D.C. with his picture and a quote from Daniel Ellsberg. This was eight or nine years ago. And it said from Dan, don't do what I did. Don't wait until more and more people have been killed in these wars. If you have the documents, speak up, share them with the public. And Dan had this profound wisdom that he shared with so many others, that if you're going to have a democracy, you need the informed consent of the governed. And when we have the uninformed pseudo-consent of the government, which we generally have on foreign policy, then people are basically being led by the nose through a mirage of the domestic media propaganda form of the fog of war. Uh, in the last 52 years of Dan Ellsberg's life, beginning with when he released the Pentagon Papers in 1971, he said that we have a moral capacity to speak out, to speak up, to be willing to take risks for nonviolent action against militarism because so many lives are at stake. A couple of people who have in recent years been charged under the Espionage Act, one of them I write about in the War Made Invisible book, Daniel Hale. As we speak here, Daniel Hale is in a federal prison. He's serving a sentence of almost four years because as somebody who was in the U.S. Air Force, he decided to reveal information about how the large majority of drone strikes don't kill the people who are the ostensible targets. Most of the people, according to the U.S. official documents that Daniel Hale revealed, most of the people killed by U.S. drone strikes are civilians. And so, as the saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished, and no really good deed goes really unpunished. So Daniel Hale, as a convicted felon under the Espionage Act, he's in prison. Now, if Daniel Hale had been allowed to testify in court as to why he did what he did, he might never have gone to prison in the first place. It's called a, if it's allowed, a choice of evils or competing harms defense. It's like if you're walking down the street and you see a big no trespassing sign in front of a house, and in the upper floor you see that the house is on fire and a child is leaning out the window crying for help, that's competing harms. Yes, you're, if you go and rescue that child, you break into the house, you're breaking the law. You're disobeying the no trespassing sign. But the competing harm of not doing that would be worse. And many times people can be acquitted if they're even charged under a circumstance like that. Well, what Daniel Hale did was to say, I can save lives if I expose the truth about how U.S. drone warfare is killing so many civilians. Compare that to Donald Trump. He also charged primarily under the Espionage Act will not be allowed, if this does come to trial, to say why he did what he did with those classified documents. Imagine what difference that would make if Donald Trump could say why he did what he did. It would make no difference at all because he couldn't present a public interest defense. There's no way that he could make a case that he did what he did with the classified documents to help the public. And it's pretty clear he did what he did to help Donald J. Trump, whereas the contrast with Daniel Hale is huge. This is a point that could be made in the mass media, but uh, don't hold your breath. There's a tremendous amount that we learn if we're activists about the political system and about the media system. And truly, a lot of what I began to learn about media bias, I learned from the Oregonian newspaper. As an activist in Portland in the 1970s and a lot of the 1980s, working on various issues and just, I mean, for instance, the Oregonian was fanatically in favor of nuclear power. And when 
many of my friends and colleagues and people I didn't know who were all working together with nonviolent direct action to close the Trojan nuclear power plant uh, up the river, we had the constant flow of editorials, official ones, from the Oregonians saying that, that we were idiots. We were crazy. The future was nuclear power, according to the Oregonian. I'm talking 1977, 1978. And then the Three Mile Island accident happened and almost uh, melted down uh, a lot of Pennsylvania. And the line began slowly to change from the Oregonian. I, I just bring that up as an example. I think that when people work on issues, and I imagine this has been the case with activists in the in Peace and Justice Works, Iraq Affinity Group, and really the case I would wager with many thousands of activists around the United States, when we really study an issue, when we learn, when we read, when we have firsthand experiences with people affected by the choices made in public policy and power exerted by corporations, we begin to see the extent of the media bias. When we really know about an issue, we see what's omitted, not even covered at all, And we see so often how the coverage is just absurd and slanted and misinformed and disinforming. Some people uh, talked about how the U.S. war on Libya wasn't not considered a war because no troops were on the ground. That question came out uh, from a Peace and Justice Works member. Um, What is your take on that? That was a fascinating reality. It was really, it's almost surreal. It's, It's like going down the rabbit hole into Alice in Wonderland in many respects. The reality was that the United States was leading the bombing of Libya in 2011. And in that process, the U.S. spent in just a few months $1 billion with a B dollars to do so. And a lot of bombs were being dropped courtesy of U.S. taxpayers. There is the War Powers Resolution, as it's known, or War Powers Act, that requires that after 90 days of U.S. involvement in a war, the president needs to get approval of Congress. So the Obama administration refused to do so. And actually, presidents generally have not heeded the rare times that the War Powers Resolution has been invoked by Congress, very rare times. So what occurred in this case is that a representative of the administration of Barack Obama went to Capitol Hill and testified that the United States was not at war. And some members of Congress, not enough, said, "Uh, can you explain that? The U.S. has been dropping bombs on Libya for more than three months, and you're saying the United States is not at war? And the response from the Obama administration was, Oh, no, the United States isn't at war. No Americans have died in it. So that, again, is a window in to the mentality we're dealing with. And I cite this example in the War Made Invisible book because it's another way that people in charge of the warfare state do their best to reduce or eliminate any capacity we have to see or understand or know about wars being done in our names with our tax dollars. I'm against what Russia is doing. I think that once we start to excuse any country for going in, crossing borders, violating international law and slaughtering people, um, that should be condemned. What the U.S. should be doing is engaging in diplomacy, which it has never done in this conflict. In more than a year and a half and back to the beginning of last year, the U.S. government refused to engage. Apparently, there's a very good chance, and I don't know if the button has been pushed, so to speak, for the U.S. to to send uh, depleted uranium to uh, Ukraine. Uh, That should be considered a war crime. Uh, The U.S. used it uh, in Iraq with terrible results. According to the best epidemiology there is, there's real reasons for concern, to put it mildly. And Yet, this is an index of what happens as a war goes on, that 
winning becomes more and more important and boundaries are trampled. And we might say that having any war that has any moral standards is, is dubious, but it gets worse and worse as time goes on. Let me, let me give you an example. In 1939, it was a truism that countries did not bomb civilian populations, would not drop bombs on cities. By 1945, that was completely out the window. Dresden, Tokyo, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. That's what happens in wars. That's why an anti-war movement is so crucial. And we shouldn't be making excuses for war makers, whether they're in the Kremlin or the White House. There's a lot of uh, revolving door from people in the military who go on to be prison guards, jail guards, and police officers. And in many ways, the similarity between the U.S. military and police forces around the country is very strong. Uh, Use of weapons, lack of accountability, reliance on violence, operating within a hierarchy, and yet when not observed and not under direct scrutiny, all kinds of moral and legal crimes are committed, whatever can be gotten away with. It's not to stereotype all police, but the failure of accountability leaves the door open. And often a lot of police officers sooner or later tend to walk through that door of abuse of their power. It's a militarization of society and we're suffering from that. I make the contention in the War Made Invisible book that that's part of the war that's invisible, that we have been acculturating so many young people, mostly men, to the idea that they should learn how to kill. The long-term implications of that are rarely talked about. Remember back in 2019, 2020, then candidate Joe Biden said, if we have another four years of Donald Trump, the character of the United States will be forever changed. We've got to stop this right now. And unfortunately, Trump was not reelected. What Biden didn't ask and has never asked is what 20 years of nonstop war has already done to the character of the United States of America. It's just not something that is dealt with. And yet you think about how many people have gone through basic training of the military, where the whole message revolves around, if you need to, you need to be able to kill people. And here's the weaponry that you need to become good at using. So if you need to, you can pull it off. And you can take the young people out of the military, but can you take the military out of the young people? Can you find an off switch after that training? I don't think so. And for many in this century, it's not just training, it's actually being thrown into battlefield conditions or perhaps push button wars where people are being killed because of what you do at your computer console. You're not there directly, but you're involved in the, the killing chain, what's called the kill chain. And This is something, again, that Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about, particularly in the last couple of years of his life. This is a a wisdom that he shared, that we need a culture of nonviolence, and we need to directly challenge the culture of violence and militarism. I think we're worse off in this culture now, perhaps, than in our lifetimes ever before. The carnage from mass shootings in the United States is just, it's a horror. And it should be named as such. There should be emphatic organizing for gun control. I get a little concerned about the way in which many of the mass media pundits and commentators and outlets like the New York Times editorialize for gun control and quite appropriately decry this terrible 
huge amount of weapons of, of not just handguns, not just rifles, but really horrific assault weapons are circulating in the United States. And I think that critique is really important. I get uncomfortable in this sense that it's not combined with a horror of what the Pentagon weapons are doing to other human beings. You write in the book about the time you spent on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you talk more, can you talk more about that and the attitude of the people you met in Iraq and Afghanistan toward the United States? How do they see us? Well, I spent very little time in Iraq and in Afghanistan, as well as in Iran, but I tried to learn from my brief visits. I went to Iraq actually before the invasion, and I went three different times between September 2002 and January 2003. And as I write in the book, each time I went from San Francisco to Baghdad, I felt not that I was going between two countries, but between two planets. It was like intergalactic travel. In the United States, more and more, the media debate, the personal debates were whether the United States should invade, how it should invade, when it should invade. And in Iraq, people I talked to, they wanted to survive. They'd already lived through the Gulf War. They'd lived through the sanctions. And each time I visited, they were more and more aware and pessimistic about a new invasion that they increasingly understood was going to come. It was a tremendous, uh, for me, a tremendous tragedy, just at a personal level, to, to meet people and know how they would be terrorized by what came to be known as shock and awe. I was taken around to a couple of different schools by the UNICEF director for Iraq. And one of them was just a complete mess, broken windows, sewage smell. The students were trying to learn in this terrible environment. And then I went to another school that UNICEF had rebuilt and it was it was relatively wonderful and the students were in a, a warm place and a comfortable classroom and I went back to the office with the director from UNICEF and he was pointing out all the gains and I said what's going to happen do you think if the US launches an invasion and it got very quiet and he said that'll be a whole other matter. And three months later, that did become a whole other matter. That's the human reality. And at a certain level, it's a human catastrophe of transcendent proportions to sit along the Tigris River and see couples sitting over candlelight, having dinner, and to know that in a few months, their communities are going to be under U.S. missiles. And this is what war is all about. Um, notably, two potential war crimes of Donald Trump don't seem to be in the book. The dropping of the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan and the assassination of General Soleimani in Iraq. Can you talk about those incidents? Yeah, there, there are a tremendous number of U.S. war crimes that aren't in the book, for sure. And in both those cases, it's the, the arrogance of power, of what the Oregon, great Oregon Senator Wayne Morse condemned in 1964, when he said the U.S. is engaging in a might makes right foreign policy. And in both of those instances, Trump ordered those attacks because he knew he could get away with it. And he believes that might makes right. And that is an operating, I won't call it principle, but it's an operating attitude, certainly prevailed under, triumph, under uh, Donald J. Trump, who was, was in himself, himself a, a terrible militarist. And despite his occasional statements to the contrary, he was a warmonger himself. So that's, that's part of the terrain we're dealing with. I'm really having trouble in foreign policy. If we set aside issues like climate change or the Paris Accords and so forth, 
I'm really having trouble distinguishing between the so-called leadership of the Democratic Party in Congress and the so-called leadership of the Republican Party in Congress. They're both unhinged at this point. And to some extent, when the Republicans in the House or Senate say, well, we should really not be throwing so much weaponry into Ukraine, that might sound like a promising attitude, but it's important to hear that what they want to do more is to confront China. So there are different priorities. There's a spectrum of different priorities. But that's, again, where a a peace movement, an anti-war movement is really crucial. And, well, I'm really pleased that I'm working with the um, whole team at rootsaction.org, and we support a lot of activism on many, many issues. We, we are multi-issue. And we were founded, frankly, because we felt that action groups like moveon.org were not anti-war if a Democrat was in the White House. And we want to have a single standard of human rights, a single standard of anti-militarism, of environmental protection, of human rights across the board. And so we have built up from from no online list to 1.2 million in the United States and another uh, 100,000 overseas. It's an action arm. We have enormous opportunities and a lot of reasons to be discouraged. And Antonio Gramsci, who went to prison under Mussolini, used the term pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And it's understandable we have a lot of pessimism. We desperately need optimism of the will. It feels much better to be active than to be passive. And Those are the opportunities that we have for the future. Norman Solomon, I just want to thank you for taking this time and um, and hanging out with us and talking with us.